Father, we bless you and we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, which means, God, that I must dismiss myself and allow you, Lord Jesus, to speak through me to your people. And so, Father God, we ask that you would lift us up now on eagle's wings and cause us to land gently upon your holy mountain so that we might see the parade of your glory as it passes by in this world. We ask, Father God, that as we descend from this holy place, this temple, that our hearts will be filled to overflowing. And Father God, that we may be able to share with someone what you have shared with us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. A pastor... I read a story about a pastor who stood before his congregation and said, I have bad news, I have good news, and I have more bad news. The congregation got quiet. The pastor said, the bad news is the church needs a new roof. The congregation groaned. The good news, the pastor said, is we have enough money to purchase the new roof. The congregation breathed a sigh of relief. And then the pastor said, the bad news is it's still in your pockets. <laughs> Somebody said to that pastor, we might need to bring some umbrellas if the money's still in my pocket. Amen. <laughs> Someone once said that bad news has no real friends. Bad news has no real friends. It's true, even in the church, nobody likes bad news. But there's an irony about bad news, and the irony is that despite the fact that we don't like it, 
It seems to be everywhere. Bad news is everywhere. In the home, on the streets, at the job, wherever we happen to be, we're inundated with bad news. And the only time we seem not to mind bad news is when it's somebody else's bad news and not our own. I saw a comic strip uh, that pointed this out, referring to the nightly news, and it read, it's ironic that they start with good evening and then persist to tell us all the reasons that it's not a good evening. Bad news. The fact is, saints, bad news is here to stay. Someone said that bad news has good legs. It both travels and stands well. All kidding aside, bad news can be, and often is, saints, a very serious matter. It can take away your appetite, ruin your sleep, cause a mental breakdown, devastate a family, bring out the worst in us, and even destroy our faith. And so from this text this morning, I'd like for us to learn some things about how to handle bad news. Is anybody in the building wanting to hear a sermon on how to handle bad news? Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. Amen, somebody. In my opinion, saints, as we set up this text this morning, uh, this particular text that we're going to be looking at this morning is perhaps the most instructional text in the Bible on how to handle bad news. It sort of serves as a model prayer. So if you're looking for something to read this week during your devotionals, I suggest that you read this whole chapter, uh, keeping in mind this prayer in particular, because this is really one of those Old Testament model prayers. And while it'll tell you how to handle bad news, it'll really give you a framework uh, for how to handle uh, any bad thing that may come into your life and in mine. And so this text is really instructional this morning, and what I want to do is just share with you some principles. I noticed that in your bulletin there's a place for taking notes, and some of you have cell phones and other devices that allow you to do the same. And so I'll just point out some things that I want you to write down so that you might have them uh, in that time of need. You see, you may not need the sermon today, but you've heard it said, and I believe it's so, that you're either on your way into a storm, coming out of a storm, or in the middle of one right now. And so there's something here for all of us. Let's look at this text. We're going to jump right in. The first thing I want you to notice in the text here is the timing of bad news. Look at verses 1 and 2, the timing of bad news. It says, verse 1, it begins with the words, it happened after this. It happened after this. And then in verse 2, we're told, then some came. So it happened after this. And then in both of these verses, we have an indication of time so that what we're being told, saints, is that what happened before this particular event is something worth consideration, something worth our consideration this morning. It happened after this. Well, if you go back to verse 19, and I'll just give you the cliff notes, uh, what you'll discover is that there in verse 19, the nation of Israel was in revival. They were there in revival, and a reformation had come across the land. The king before uh, Jehoshaphat was not a good king, and he led the nation into some dangerous ways. They were worshiping idols. They were putting up Asherah poles, and all kinds of idol worship was taking place in the land, and God was not given his proper place in Judah or Israel 
at this particular time. And so the chronicler here tells us that it happened after this. That is, in other words, what we're being told here is that just when you decide you want to do the right thing by God, it's when you decide that you're going to live right and do right. It's when you decide that you're ready to go through a revival, a personal revival in your life. It's at that particular time, on the heels of revival, that the enemy will often make himself known. You notice the enemy doesn't bother us too much when we're not doing the work of God. He doesn't bother us too much when uh, we're not about the things of God, when we are in those lapses in our lives where we're not giving ourselves over to God as we ought to be. But the moment you decide, I'm going to do right by God, here is Satan showing up. I hear people say all the time, my life was doing just fine until I decided to sell out for Jesus. You've heard people say it. I, you know, things were going well, and then I decided to give my life fully over to Jesus. And all of a sudden, it was one thing after another. And saints, that's because Satan isn't about to stand idly by and watch revival take place in your life and in my life without making some attempt to destroy it. The text says it happened after this. Notice what happened. Uh, it says in verse 1 there, it happened after this, and then if you go down to verse 2, it says, Then some came to Jehoshaphat, saying, watch this, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon, Tamar, which is in Gedi. And so we're being told here that a great multitude decides to come up against the nation of Israel. It's interesting that if this had been just one foe coming up against Jehoshaphat and the nation of Israel, perhaps they could have handled that with their own army. But the text is clear to point out that this was a great multitude that was coming up against Jehoshaphat and the nation of Israel. Notice the nature, the nature of the enemy here. The Bible tells us here in verses uh, 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 one and two, it says that the enemy was coming to attack, that the enemy was greater and mightier than they were, and that the enemy was closing in fast. The text saints is trying to help us to understand how uh, severe this bad news was. This wasn't your typical bad news. This was some really bad, bad news. So much so that it caused uh, Jehoshaphat to respond. It caused him to respond. I want you to notice and keep this in mind as we kind of go through the text. I'll point it out to you. that the Bible says this was a great multitude that had come uh, uh, against Israel and there was the people of Moab, and the people uh, of Moab were joining with the people of Ammon and with the other uh, 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 enemies besides those from Mount Seir. All of them had come together against Israel. And the thing I want you to see right off the bat, and we'll get to it later, is that these particular uh, nations of peoples didn't even like each other. They were enemies to each other, and yet they were able to come together to thwart the work of God. I wish somebody knew what I was talking about this morning. You see, watch this. A lot of times, when you receive bad news, if it's just one thing, you might be able to handle it. But when it's bad, bad news, when it's severe, bad news, you need some instruction from the word of God to keep you from going out of your mind. Amen, somebody. What's the nature of your bad news this morning, saints? Is it your spouse is talking about leaving you? What's the nature of your bad news? Is it you're going to lose your job or your house is being foreclosed on? What's the nature of your bad news this morning? 
Is it that the doctor gave you a negative report? The doctor saw something on your x-ray? Is it that a close relative is not doing well? What is the nature of your bad news? And what is the nature of my bad news? Whatever it is, saints, this morning, our aim is not to make light of it. That's not why we came this morning. Our aim is not to trivialize your situation. Our purpose this morning is to ensure you that God's word gives us some things that can help us when the news is so scary, when the news is so dark and so bleak that you don't know how you're going to make do beyond it. I stopped by to encourage somebody this morning. Notice that verse 3 begins with the words, and Jehoshaphat feared. You see that in your text this morning? That word means to make terrified. It means to become dreadful or frightened or afraid. The writer wasn't using hyperbole here. He wasn't trying to exaggerate the point. He was really making the point, and the point was that Jehoshaphat was afraid, period. He was afraid, and I like the candor and the honesty and the directness of the text this morning, saints, because it reminds me that I'm not only, or I'm not the only one uh, who becomes afraid when I receive bad news. I like the text because it's reminding me, saints, that I'm uh, not the only one who dreads that 3 a.m. in the morning phone call. I'm not the only one. The text is helping us to understand that we're not the only ones who have to deal with bad news and our first response to bad news is often to become fearful. I wish somebody would say amen to that. But I think secondly and more importantly, the text is trying to help us to understand, watch this, you may wanna write this down, that fear may be my first response to bad news, but it doesn't have to be my final response to bad news. There was a Nobel Prize winning psychologist by the name of Daniel Kahneman. And he is noted for his work as it relates to psychology of judgment and decision making. And he once observed that the brains of humans contain a mechanism that is designed to give priority to bad news. In other words, this renowned doctor is telling us that bad news is hard to shake off. That's really what he's saying. He's saying that when bad news arrives at your doorstep, it doesn't want some of your attention. It wants all of your attention. It doesn't want some of your time. It wants all of your time. This doctor says there's something in our natural DNA that causes us to give priority to bad news. And if we're honest, even in the church, I know we try to be spiritual and all, but even in the church, we find this to be true. You can look through the scriptures and note how many times God says, don't be fearful or fear not. Because you see, as sheep, our tendency is to run scared. It's just our nature. Well, if I could uh, impose myself on this doctor's work, and his work is well respected, if I could impose myself on this doctor's work, I would simply add to what he says by reminding him that while fear may be my first response, it doesn't have to be my final response. Amen. And we see that here in the text that oftentimes, watch this, we give uh, 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 bad news the priority and that priority is usually manifested in fear. In other words, when we hear bad news, if it's bad enough, it tends to make us afraid, to run scared. The priority we give to bad news is normally couched in fear. But you see, fear doesn't have to be my final response. Yeah, 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 as we look at this text, what you see is that first we're told that Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was afraid. But see, because he's a man of God, watch this, he understands that while that may be my first response, it doesn't have to be my final response. And so he follows up his fear with the fact that the Bible says that he set his mind on seeking God. 
Yeah, he set his mind on seeking God. If you're writing, write this down. I think it'll help you. If you're writing, listen to this. Bad news is the reason that every Christian needs to have a war room. Bad news is the reason that you and I need to have a war room. If you can't think of any other reason to have a war room, a, a, a prayer closet, a secret place where you can go and strategize, a good reason to have a place where you can go and get with God and pour out your heart to him, bad news is a good reason for every believer to have a war room. Every believer. By war room, I mean a prayer closet, a secret place uh, for you to go and set up and be with God, a place where you can get strategy worked out and get your marching orders, a secret place where God is given the first crack at whatever's cracking you up. We need a war room. We need a place where we can go and wrestle uh, with God about the things in our lives. And the reason we need a war room, saints, is because the Bible is clear. The Bible makes it clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You see, saints, this text reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle, that, that we are in a spiritual warfare every time we lift our heads off of the pillow. We are in a battle. We are in a battle, a spiritual battle. And in that battle, you're going to hear uh, about casualties, and you're going to hear things that could cause you to be spooked off and become afraid. But when you know that you've got a war room, a place where you can go and strategize and get with God and allow God to speak with you and allow God to help you through your situation, you're better off. We need a place to counter that first response of bad news. We need a war room. We need a place that we can go, saints, watch this, where uh, God gets first priority, where, as I said, he gets first crack at whatever's cracking you. See, a lot of times we like to run to mama and them and pastor and them when we need to be running to God and them. Amen. I know it's bad English, but amen, it's good theology. Amen. We need to run to God the Father, God, you know, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and allow him to deal with whatever uh, we have going on in our lives. And so the text says that after he heard the bad news, he became afraid, but he didn't stop there at fear. He set his heart to seek the Lord. Look at verse 3b there. It says, he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. The only way to conquer fear, saints, is by shifting your perspective from fear to faith. I know you've heard it before, but that's what prayer does. Prayer allows us to get a new perspective on our situation. It allows us to see things differently than perhaps the way that we're looking at them. In other words, there was no doubt in Jehoshaphat's mind as to what he needed to do. And notice, depending on how bad your situation might be, you may even have to turn down a plate or two in order to give priority to your prayers. It says he set himself on seeking God in prayer, but he didn't stop there. He also called for a fast. Oh, see, saints get quiet when you start talking about fasting, Pastor. But sometimes your situation is so severe that you even need to turn down a few plates. Watch this, not to try to change God's mind, but to clear up your own mind and so that you're not distracted by the things uh, in your life, the things in the world where you can be alone with God and says, God, you got all of my attention now. You've got all of my attention, and that's what he does. So he depends on God. He looks to God. He set his mind. That word set himself means to fasten. It means he gave himself over to. He dedicated himself to seeking God. So that the purpose of Jehoshaphat's prayer here, saints, was to confront his dilemma 
A. B, it was to acknowledge his fear and his concerns. And three, it was to proclaim his dependence upon God. Some of us become uneasy when we get bad news, but I'm telling you, there are some things in this text that can help us when we get bad news. And the text is really a text about a great prayer of a man of God who was in a desperate situation. And so Jehoshaphat prays in order to remind himself that the God he serves is bigger than his worst bad news. You see, sometimes we need to get God's perspective on this thing. And it's like, you know, using your thumb to, to, to block out the sun. The sun is massive. The sun is big. If we ever got too close to it, it would literally cause us to, you know, disintegrate in, in a matter of seconds. Uh, this great sun, but you can take your finger and with the right perspective, you can block out the whole sun. And by going into prayer, Jehoshaphat is helping us to understand that my situation may be big, it may be gloomy, it may be bad news, it may be something that I don't know how I'm going to handle. But if I now take and get that right perspective where I see God and not my situation, I understand that God is bigger than all of my problems put together. I like the way he does it. Notice what he does. I love this prayer because he, he, he does something that I think we ought to, to, to do. What he does is he begins his prayer by recalling who his God is. He begins this prayer by reminding himself the God whom he serves. See, saints, I often tell the folks over at PBF, the good way to start your prayer is by rehearsing to yourself this great God that you serve. Amen. You ought to say to yourself, when you begin your prayer, you ought to say to yourself, God, I thank you uh, that I don't worship the God made of man's hands, the God formed out of the imaginations of men carved into stone or into wood or into some kind of a precious metal. I thank you, God, that I serve the true and living God. You need to remind yourself that the God you serve is the true and living God. I say to the saints, you need to go on from there and say, God, I thank you that you're sovereign, that you sit high above all things, and one day all authority has to answer up to you, that nobody gets away with anything in your universe. God, I thank you. You need to tell yourself, I thank you, God, that you're omniscient, that you know everything there is to know, that there's nothing that escapes your knowing. And I thank you, God, that your word declares that you can be everywhere present at the same time. Hallelujah. So you can work on my situation and my mama's situation at the same time. Hallelujah. And lose no space and lose no ground. But God, it would be one thing if you had omniscience and, 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 and omnipresence. But I thank you that your word declares that you have all power. Yeah, that means that you can affect the situation wherever you find it, whenever you know it. You see, you, you got to begin by reminding yourself of the great God that you serve. And that's what the uh, 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 Jehoshaphat does here. He begins to sort of rehearse who the God is that he serves. He begins to recall the goodness of God and how sovereign God is, his power and his might. Notice how he does it. He says, I love the way he does it. He says, oh, Lord, God of our fathers. Watch this. Verse three. Watch this. He says, are you not God in heaven? Notice he's using the negative. He's speaking from the negative. Are you not? In other words, he's helping us to understand that these are just rhetorical questions. In other words, I already know the answer, God, but, 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 but I'm, I'm going to challenge myself. He says, are you not God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Watch this. By phrasing each of these characteristics in this particular rhetorical way, Jehoshaphat is saying, God, feel free whenever you get ready to stop me. Feel free, God, whenever you get ready to tell me where I'm wrong. He says, feel free to tell me that you're not the sovereign God who sits high and looks low. 
Feel free to tell me that you don't sit outside of the arc of time and you know the end from the beginning and the uh, beginning from the end. He says, are you not that God? And in these passages, uh, we don't have time to go through all of them. He begins all the way through from verse 6 to verse 11 to uh, just sort of tell himself, recall the things about God. He says in verse 6, God, you're sovereign. In verse 6, he says, God, you're powerful. In verse 7, he reminds God that he has a covenant with him. In verse 8 and 9, he talks about the presence of God. In verse 10, he talks about the goodness of God. In verse 11, he talks about the fact that God is his possession. But I love what he does. What really gets me excited is verse 9. Look at verse 9. It says there in verse 9, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. And then he almost pauses parenthetically, and he says, For your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Jehoshaphat reminds God in this verse that he's uh, uh, not praying to just any old God, but he's praying to a personal God. He's saying, God, here we are standing in this temple in the new courtyard. Here we are standing here, all of the people, wives and children. We're standing here and we're beseeching you, God. And as he's doing that, it's almost as if he reminds himself, God, your name is in this temple. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying when you get into your prayer room and to deal with your bad news, you need to remind God that his name is in your temple. Yeah, you need to tell God, God, your name is written in blood on my life. Your name is in this temple. You be I belong to you, Lord, and you belong to me. Your name is in this temple. The enemy is coming to take me out, God, but your name is in this temple. The news doesn't look good at all. It's not promising, God, but your name is in this temple. God, I'm afraid to answer the phone. I'm afraid to open up the mail. But I just remembered your name is in this temple. Paul said it this way to, to the Corinthians. He says, do not or do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? He goes on to say, you are not your own. See, saints, you're not your own. You belong to God. So whatever comes into your life, you just need to remind God, oh, God, your name is on my life. Your name is in this temple. John put it this way in, in 1 John chapter 4. He says, you are of God, little uh, children, and have overcome them because, watch this, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Your name is in this temple. Notice also that he not only recalls those things, but in this prayer he recounts his dependence upon God. I love this prayer, this model prayer, because not only does it help us to understand how to structure our prayer life and, and to, 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 to be able to begin by saying, our Father, which art in heaven, to sort of begin there and sort of get a picture of who God is in our lives. But he also then goes on to recount what the problem is. He then goes on to recount his dependence upon God. Look at verse 12 there as we kind of rush through this text. He says, our God, oh, our God, will you not judge them? Watch this. For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. You see, instead of relying on his own strength, instead of relying on his own cunning, instead of relying on his, his, his own wit, he goes to God and he says, God, I need you to work it out. See, some of us need to stop working it out in our own strength. Some of us need to stop running uh, to figure out how we can get out of the bad situation that we're in. We need to just drop to our knees and say, God, I'm dependent on you. God, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. And they recall the fact that they have no power. He says, we have no power. He recalls, we don't know what to do. But then he says, but our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you, God. 
when you go into your prayer time, listen to me. You receive that bad news. You don't know how to handle that bad news that you're getting. You need to be able to go to God and fall to your face and say, God, I'm dependent upon you. I don't know how I'm going to extract myself from this situation, but I rely on you. God, I give it to you. I love the fact that the verse also tells us that, you know, uh, they took the, the, these men took their children and they took their wives in the prayer with them. Sometimes, men, we can sort of try to handle it all alone. Yeah, we, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell my wife about how bad the situation is. I'm just going to handle it all by myself. And here you are cracking up and there's no peace in your house and your wife can't understand why and your children don't know where your smile went. Listen, you need to gather your family up together and say we've got a crisis. We've got a situation that we need to deal with and take it to God in prayer as a family. I often tell folks there are times when you need to close your bedroom door uh, from the kids, but uh, prayer is not one of those times. That our children need to see us on our knees. They need to see us on our faces, men. They need to see us uh, before God and, and wrestling with them about the issues of life so that they know that when bad news comes, that's not the only time you wrestle with God. Yeah. See, if you wait till bad news comes before you begin to wrestle with God, Listen, you, you're going to be out of shape. Yeah, 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 you're going to be out of shape. You're not going to kind of know how to do it. Now, I know the pastor said do some things, but I can't remember quite what it is. No, see, when, 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 listen, when, when the good times come in your life, somebody told me a long time ago that preparation is not wasted time. That, that, that preparation is the time where we prepare ourselves for whatever's coming next. Amen. So that prayer ought to be something that we do with our families. And there he was. These verses tell us that they waited to hear from God, that they listened carefully to his instructions, that they were there seeking the Lord. Lord, I need a word from you. God, I need to hear from you. If, if, if I've never heard from you before, God, I need to hear from you now. You see, the next thing that happens in this prayer is that literally here they are on their faces before God in prayer. They're fasting before God because they need to hear a word from God. And then out of the midst of the congregation comes one of the Levites. Out of the midst comes one of the praisers. And he begins to tell them to not be afraid. He says to them, this battle is not yours but God's. You see, you need to get on your knees and stay there until you hear God say, the battle is not yours, but mine. This is not your battle. This is my battle. Anybody need a word like that this morning? Anybody need to hear this battle is not yours, but it's the Lord's. The battle is God's. And here they are, saints, a beautiful picture of what uh, uh, the church ought to look like on every Sunday morning. We ought to come with an expectation to hear from God. Too many times we come to church uh, and all we want to do is go through the routine and get it over with so we can get home and get on with the rest of our lives. But we ought to walk into the church door saying, God, I'm coming to hear from you this morning. God, I need a word from you. I need you to speak into my situation. Yeah, see, I know we come, we looking all clean and all good, and, you know, we got our hair did and all that stuff. We look the part, but you know what we're like? We're like ducks viewed from the surface of the pond. On the surface, ducks look like they're just kind of real smooth. But, man, if you can look underneath the water, they paddle it like crazy, <laughs> you know. And a lot of times, that's the way our lives are. We come to church and we look real cool and real calm and real collected. But watch this. In your secret place, in, 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 in your own heart, you know that you are paddling like crazy. Trying to figure out how you're going to deal with the situations in your life. Well, see, this text is helping us to understand that we can go to God in prayer. That he won't leave us. That you don't have to 
you know, uh, 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 worry when you give it over to God. And when you hear a word from God where God is saying to you, the battle is not yours. In other words, God is saying, you need to lighten up because this ain't got nothing to do with you. Remember, you belong to me and I belong to you. This is my fight. This is my battle. It's not your battle. We need to hear that it's not a battle. Notice. Let me get to the end of this thing. Notice what they do. Verse 17, I mean, verse 18. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 and 19, it tells us there that they worshiped and praised the Lord in advance of their victory. Watch this. Verse 18, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Listen, saints, you don't have to wait until the battle is over. You can begin to shout now over your situation. I know what I'm talking about. Listen, after you prayed and cried and prayed and cried, after you uh, uh, replaced your fear with faith, after you reminded God uh, that his name is in your temple, after you told God, that God, he can be depended upon. After you told him that, God, I'm waiting to hear a word from you. After he gives you a word of instruction, saints, and while you're waiting for your victory and while you're waiting for your change to come, watch this, praise your way to your breakthrough. Yeah, you need to praise your way through your breakthrough. See, when you get into your, your secret closet and in your place where you go before God, it begins with you praying and saying, oh God, I thank you that you're this kind of God and God, I'm dependent upon you. Somewhere in the midst of your praise, what will happen is you'll begin to hear a song in your heart. Oh yeah, you'll begin to hear the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. You'll begin to hear one of those great hymns of the faith, or it might even be a chorus, or it might be something you heard on the radio, a tie tribute. If you did it before, you can do it again. Whatever it is, watch this, that thing will begin to bubble up inside of you. And all of a sudden, your prayer takes on a new dimension where you just begin to worship God and thank God for whatever it is that you're going through. And all of a sudden, there's you're praising him and as you're praising him and thanking him your breakthrough comes and you say God I thank you that when I came into this place I came in one way but I'm going out a whole different way God because you're good to me you you're, you're, God you bless me hallelujah I can withstand and that's what the nation does yeah this nation as they're there praying the text says that they were there prostrate on their faces. It was common in those days that they would take their head and literally place it on the ground. Their forehead would be pressing against the ground and there they would be saying, God, we worship you. We thank you, God, for all that you are. And then the text really gets exciting because look at verse 21, because we can just let the text kind of talk to us uh, by itself this morning. Look at verse 21, and let's read what happened. It says, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, watch this, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's all right to get excited. And watch this, verse 22 says, now when they began to sing and to praise, look at this, the Lord set an ambush against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. You see that? Oh, y'all missed a good place to shout. I know this is one of those reformed churches. Y'all don't shout. But you just need a good shout. If you can't shout, just raise your hand and say, hey! Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. See, the Lord told them that it was his battle. Didn't he say it was? The Lord said it was his battle. And so on that note, they began to worship God and say, well, we might as well just go ahead and praise him because the battle is already won. The is ours. The Lord promised it to us. See, a lot of times 
We can't do that because even though we got a word from God saying the victory is mine or the battle is mine, guess what? We're still in doubt. We're still in fear. God, I'm trying to praise you, but I just can't praise you. God, every time I turn my head over, all I can think about is this situation. God, you got to do something. Listen to me. Your situation is going to be there. God is going to handle it. You might as well go ahead and praise him. Let me help you out. Let me help you out. If you don't know what to do, if you don't know what to say, if you're really still afraid and fearful, do like that old joker did in the New Testament. And he said, yes, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. Sometimes you got to say, God, I believe you. Oh, but God, help my unbelief. Because I don't know how we're going to make it out of this situation. Yeah, but watch this. What they did was they began to worship God and to praise God. And the text says that while they are worshiping God, the Lord sets an ambush. I told you earlier that these folks didn't like each other, but they came together against the nation of Israel. Watch this. When the Bible tells us that the Lord set an ambush, here's what he did. The text says that two of the enemies decide, decided to get together against the other enemy before they went into battle against Israel. So it was like Ammon and Moab said, you know what? I think just the two of us can take out Israel. <laughs> and we don't like the people of Mount Seir. And y'all don't like it. So I tell you what. While we're waiting for the children of Israel, let's go ahead and, you know, sabotage these jokers. And so they began taking out the people of Mount Seir, and they just began going after them, right? And, and watch this. Keep in your back of your mind that Israel is just praising God. Oh, God, we bless you. And all of a sudden, they began to hack off the heads of, of, of the people of Mount Seir until they were all destroyed. But then, somewhere in the battle, they forgot that the Ammonites don't like the Moabites. And they all hooked up in this battle, and they killed all the people from Seir, and they caught up. And so they turned around and said, you my enemy too. You my enemy too. And they began slicing each other's heads off. Watch this. And the text says, by the time Israel got to the ridge where the battle was to be fought, after they had been praying, Matter of fact, they were so bad, choir, they were so bad that they put the choir out in front of the army. <laughs> now, I know y'all ain't going for that. <laughs> Pastor say, we got a tremendous battle. We're going to put the praises out in the front. Amen. Y'all go ahead out front. <laughs> Pastor, you must have lost your mind. And there they are marching, praising God, singing those great Hallel songs. And they were praising God and worshiping God. And they were setting themselves for battle. And when they get to the ridge where the battle was going to be fought, they look down. Am I seeing this right? Either them folks are sleeping or they dead. Now, either way, it's good for us. If they sleep, we can go ahead and ambush them and get them before they get us. But now somebody else said, no, no, they're not sleeping. That looks like blood. <laughs> and all those jokers killed each other. Listen, you've got some enemies in your life. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the devil. I'm talking about Satan. Yeah, and he wants to destroy you. Yeah, the Bible makes it clear that his goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. But watch this. Whatever bad news he's able to deliver in your life, whatever bad news he's able to deliver in my life, listen, all we've got to do is remember the God that we serve. Yeah, we need to block out with our finger the giant of the devil and see our God. And we need to begin to worship him. And we need to begin to just worship and praise God and say, God, I thank you that you are mightier than my enemies. 
Listen, you can worry if, if that suits your fancy. You can worry. But all worry is going to do is make your hair turn gray. Or make it fall out. As you can see, I've done a lot of worrying in my days. <laughs> and some of y'all ain't too far behind me. Amen. <laughs> Oh, watch this. You can praise your way to victory. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, you can praise your way to victory. You can give it over to God early on in the process and say, God, I don't know how we're going to get this done. But I do know that the psalmist says, I once was young, but now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I'm going to leave you with this. The hardest thing to do, saints, the hardest thing to do is to trust God even when you know providing for your need moment by moment. There was a time in my wife and in, in my life when our kids were just young that here we are living over in Jersey and you need a car to go everywhere in Jersey, even to the supermarket. And I lost my job. My wife was still working, but I lost my job. And the car broke down. And the children still needed to get to the daycare. And my wife still needed to get to work. To work. And I watched as the Lord would put things in place to take care of us. As the bank account began to slowly dwindle away. I became more and more afraid. I said, Lord, you got to help me and my family. My wife needs to get to the bus stop to get over to Philadelphia to get to work. My children need to get to daycare. All of a sudden, a good friend of ours, a neighbor from around the corner, volunteers. I'll drop the kids off and drop you off at the bus stop. I saw God working it out, saints. But it didn't stop me from worrying. I said, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Lord, you made a way today, but what about tomorrow? I began to put down a down payment on my worries for tomorrow while I watched God take care of my worries for today. We got to cut that out, y'all. Amen. And every day I watched God do another miracle. And it was beyond the fact that there was any money in the bank and all of that kind of stuff. Day after day, I watched as God provided. He made a way. It, 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 through that whole situation, it might have been about eight months, through that whole situation, God provided. He took care of every need we had. We never went without food. Even if we needed to go shopping, a buddy from the church might come by at nine in the evening and say, come on, man, let's go to the supermarket. God made a way. But my point is, what I learned after that, what I learned was, God, I'm so sorry because I watched you each day take care of me and my family. But each day I became more and more afraid about the next day. God, I don't know how you're going to do it tomorrow. I know you did it today, but what about tomorrow? Listen, saints, what I should have been doing was just saying, God, I thank you. I thank you for making a way today because the fact of the matter is tomorrow ain't even promised to me. Amen. I can't do nothing about tomorrow, but God, you took care of my today. Hallelujah. Listen, when you come here on Sunday mornings, don't look at these worshipers and just think, you know, another song for another Sunday. But really, you need to have an expectation that says, God, I need something from you. Whether you're in good times or bad times, good news or bad news, God, I need something from you. And we ought to come in here with an expectation before the pastor even gets to the pulpit. And we need to become like some of those good, charismatic Christians that we see. This place needs to be turned up and on fire for God. Folks ought to be wanting to look in here just to see what's going on. I'm not talking about being like one of those crazy charismatics. But I'm saying somebody who is turned on by the Holy Spirit who knows how to give God a praise because God is doing something in your life. Well, my time is gone, but 
Perhaps before I leave, I need to remind somebody. If you're not saved, you need to know that all of your news is bad news. If you're not saved this morning, you need to know that there is no good news except for the good news that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the good news is found in the gospel. And so if you're not saved this morning, every head bowed. If you're not saved this morning, we want to give you an opportunity. As the brother testified this morning, he came here one day in 1978 and gave his life to the Lord, has been running ever since. If you're here this morning, you don't know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. Why don't you slip your hand up in the air? I'll, I'll acknowledge you. Why don't you slip your hand in the air if you don't know God? There's room for you. The good news is that Christ died for your sins. The good news is that while you were yet his enemy, he gave his life on an old rugged cross. He spilled his blood for you and for me. That invitation still remains for the rest of us. If you're here this morning and you've been struggling with trusting God in your situation, can I recommend this chapter of Second Chronicles to you? Can I recommend that you read it during the week and you use it as a model for how you're going to pray from here until God resolves your situation? Father, I pray for these under the sound of my voice that you will give them faith for the journey that, Lord Jesus, we will find in these principles some things that will help us to trust you more, to know, Father God, that it's not our battle. The battle belongs to you. So that whatever it might be, God, whether it's a co-worker on the job, whether it's a situation in the neighborhood, whether it's a, a relative or a parent, that we understand, Lord Jesus, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. Therefore, we need your strength, God. We need you to fight our battles. And so, Father God, I pray for these, Lord Jesus, and myself, that you will give us faith for the journey.